G'day guys, Jason here. Welcome back to my fish room. So in today's video, we're going to be discussing what is possibly my favourite secret of all the secrets in the entire world. I'm really sorry guys, I just want to quickly cut in here and just make mention that I've been working on this video for a number of weeks now. I have been promising this video since May 2020, it's now August 2020, and I obviously have completed the video now. But I can't think of a better way to celebrate completing the creation of this video than reaching the milestone on my YouTube channel with 500 subscribers. I really just want to thank each and every one of you for subscribing to my channel. I can't believe it. I really do appreciate it. All you guys subscribing motivates me to continue to produce content for you guys and hopefully informative and useful content. So just once again, I want to thank each and every one of you. I really do appreciate your support. Now, onto the video. In fact, I like this secret so much that I made it my channel logo. And if you've been wondering what that fish is in my channel logo, then want to know more. Because today, we're going to be doing an in-depth species profile on that fish. And that fish is Alto Lamprologus calvus. So why don't we get straight into the video with my in-depth species profile on this fish. Alto Lamprologus calvus is a cichlid that is endemic to Lake Tanganyika in Africa. A number of varieties are found in the lake. However, the most common in the aquarium hobby are the white calvus and black calvus. There are also yellow varieties, but these aren't as common. In each of these varieties, there are a number of slightly different colour morphs, depending on where they are geographically located in the lake. Some of these colour morphs do look very similar, and some are very hard to tell apart without an experienced eye. Now, I thought I would include some research into the meaning of the name of the fish. This is because part of the meaning aids us in identifying the difference between Altolamprologus calvus and Altolamprologus compressorceps as the two species do look similar. So the name alto, or altus in Latin, in the word alto lamprologus means high, and this refers to their high back, while the name calvus in Latin means bald, and this refers to the lack of scales between the eyes of the calvus. Now, I should say that I'm not sure what the Latin meaning of the name lamprologus is. I'm putting a huge caveat around what I'm about to say. Any searches I did online failed to reveal the true Latin meaning of the name. However, like many Latin names for fish, the names are generally made up of different words. So if you break up the word Lamprologus into Lampro and Logus, you do get some translations. Lampro translates to lustrous in Latin, while Logus translates to lark or joke. So does that mean Lamprologus means lustrous lark? Like I said, I'm putting a huge caveat on that bit of info, so don't quote me on it. Now, like I said before, calvus is not to be confused with the similar looking Altolamprologus compressorceps. When viewed side on, calvus have a more slender or bullet shaped body, while compressorceps typically have a higher and somewhat stubbier body. Altolamprologus compressorceps typically also have a steeper forehead and a somewhat shorter face. Also, they may sometimes lack the iridescent spots that calvus exhibit, but this isn't always the case. And with all these features I'm describing, sometimes calvus can exhibit features that compressorceps have, and sometimes compressorceps can also exhibit features that calvus have. And before I go on, I should also point out that calvus and compressorceps can hybridize. Therefore, they should definitely not be kept together. We want to keep the bloodlines as pure as possible in the hobby. And it goes without saying that different color morphs of calvus will also hybridize together. For example, do not breed white calvus with black calvus as the fry will be hybrids. Again, we need to do our best to keep the species as pure as possible in the hobby. Also, like I said earlier, it can be very difficult to sometimes distinguish between the different color morphs of calvus. And that also extends to some confusion between even telling the differences between black calvus or white calvus. This is because white calvus can turn very dark and vice versa. Black calvus can turn very light depending just on their mood. So keep that in mind if you intend to put them in the same aquarium, as you may have some difficulty identifying which fish is which. Like compressorceps, calvus is a stalking type hunter, and its somewhat unique shape plays two roles in its success as a hunter. One, it has evolved into this beautiful compressed shape because it allows it access into tight gaps between rocks to eat fry and the eggs of other fish. And two, their compressed body also makes it difficult for their prey to see them when they're faced head on. Now, I'm not sure if what I'm about to say is correct, but I also believe the stripes down the length of their body might play a similar role to the stripes on a tiger's body. The stripes might help break up the shape of the fish when it is hunting for prey in tight caps between rocks. I believe these stripes help them blend into their surroundings 
and potentially make it even more difficult for their prey to see them, aiding to further camouflage calvus, meaning the stripes might also play a role in making the fish itself look like further gaps between the rocks. Again, I'm not sure if this is the case, it's just something I've considered while observing the fish. They also have very large mouths and strong jaws for their size and are able to fit larger than expected fish in it. Observing them eat and how they can extend their jaws out, they have a protrudable mouth that is very effective at suction feeding, drawing further water and prey trying to swim away into their mouths. However, although they are a hunter and have evolved into a frying machine, they are a surprisingly peaceful fish and make a great addition to a Tanganyikan community cichlid tank. But that is as long as the fish you keep them with aren't small enough to fit into their mouths. An example of what not to keep with them are shell dwelling cichlids. It is also best not to keep them with aggressive fish, as calvus can be quite shy and you'll end up never seeing them if they feel threatened. They should be given plenty of rocks and caves so that they feel comfortable and you can also supply them with a large shell or two per fish for them to retreat to as they need. As with all cichlids from Lake Tanganyika, these guys really do benefit from stable water parameters. That is because Lake Tanganyika is the second largest lake in the world. The water parameters are very stable and do not fluctuate quickly. So keep up your water changes with say 15 to 20 percent per week. Avoid large infrequent water changes as the fluctuating water parameters may harm your fish. This is especially true with calvus. They are more sensitive to fluctuating water parameters than other cichlids from Lake Tanganyika. While tank raised calvus are hardier than wild caught specimens, they are still sensitive to changes in water parameters and that includes temperature swings. And with that, I should say that these guys are not a great fish for beginners starting out in the hobby. You'd want some experience keeping other Tanganyikan cichlids first before giving these guys a go. They require a high pH and I wouldn't have them in water below a pH of 8. They also require hard water and I would recommend at least a DKH of 10 and up. If you have seen my other videos, you know I use a product to raise my pH and keep my water hard as my tap water is very soft. It goes without saying that these guys are also not very tolerant of any ammonia or nitrite. Also keep your nitrates below 25 ppm. The best way to do this is just to keep up with frequent water changes. As long as you do that, you shouldn't have any problems with your calvus and they could live up to 10 years. However, they are slow growers. Male calvus can grow to a length of approximately 13 centimeters. However, there are reports of wild specimens growing to 16 centimeters. That's half a foot, while females grow to a max size of around 8 centimetres to 10 centimetres. You can see the huge size difference between the male and female here. The male is over double the size of the female, but they take a very long time to reach their max size. Calvus are very slow growing fish, requiring approximately two years to reach sexual maturity. That said, I believe the fry you see here have grown fairly fast and are just under an inch. They were born at the beginning of March 2020 and as of filming, it is the end of July 2020, so they are six months old here. These guys eat a range of food and I feed my guys frozen brine shrimp, frozen mysis shrimp, live daphnia, my homemade frozen fish food, which is white fish, prawns and boiled peas and carrots, as well as the different types of new life spectrum pellets I now have. I rotate between those foods to ensure that they are getting the best balanced diet I can give them. I try to feed two smaller feedings a day, but that is sometimes difficult to do with work. Now I should mention that when I first got my white calvus, they were extremely shy. It took me months to get them used to their tank and also used to me. I didn't have a, that problem with the black calvus, but the white calvus would constantly hide. To help them feel more at ease, I added some of my largest female endler guppies. Doing this played two roles. One, I used the guppies as dither fish, making the white calvus feel more at ease as they could see other fish swimming around. This made them feel comfortable as to them that meant there were no other large fish about. And two, as the guppies were female, this supplied the calvus with a great source of live food as the female guppies gave birth to their fry. Female guppies can stay fertile for up to 10 months without males in the tank with them. So this was perfect for my calvus. Doing this really worked because over time I saw the calvus more and more and they were getting a good source of food. I kept the female guppies in the tank right up to the day my white calvus spawned for the first time. Now I got very lucky with my pair. I purchased what was sold as an adult pair. They were not sold as say a breeding pair and even if they were sold as a breeding pair there is no guarantee that they would spawn for me. Usually though I'd recommend that you buy at least four young calvus, let them grow up together and in time a pair will usually form. But like I said 
that takes time as they are slow growers. So I got very lucky with my pair. I bought them back in November 2019 and they had their first spawn in late February 2020. So I only had to wait four months. Again, I just got very lucky with this pair, but you don't need to breed them just as a pair. Calvus have also been known to harem breed and one male will spawn with multiple females if they are available. But I only have ever had a pair, so I won't comment on the success of that. Sexing is almost impossible when Calvus are young, and this is another reason to buy at least four young Calvus to improve your chances of getting both sexes. However, apart from the size difference, males do have longer and pointier dorsal and anal fins, but this does not show up until the fish are mature. In the wild, these guys are solitary fish, usually only coming together to spawn, and this is definitely something I have observed in my pair. My male usually swims above his two shells in the centre of the tank, while my female stays at the back left corner of the tank behind the cave. She does sometimes venture out of that area, but usually sticks to the left hand side of the tank if she does. For the months I have owned this pair, I would never see the female, and if you watch my earlier videos, you will see me actually say on camera something like, this is the first time I'm seeing the female out. Then, about a week before they spawn the first time, I noticed the female out a lot more than usual, still hanging near the left side of the tank, but not hiding in the caves. I remember being very pleased that she was finally coming out and not getting as scared as much. Then to my shock, she suddenly disappeared. I didn't see her for days, probably three or four, and I was really starting to worry. I just couldn't believe it. She was finally feeling comfortable, and now she is gone? I was sure she was dead, either killed by the male, or maybe she jumped out. I even thought maybe she got crushed by the rocks as the male was doing a lot of digging at the time. I reached a point where I was about to take the lids off the tank and pull out all the rock work to find her. And then I found her, and she was in the male's shell. I was so happy. I was sure that they had spawned. But then I realised she wasn't moving. My heart sank. I thought she maybe had gotten stuck in the shell or just died already. I have had cichlids die from getting stuck in shells before. So I just kept watching and waiting and hoping she would eventually move. The longer I watched, the worse I felt. Just waiting for her to move and then boom, she moved around. I was so relieved and so happy. And then I was absolutely sure they had spawned. I was so lucky that the male oriented the shell in the ideal position for me to look down into the shell. Otherwise, I would never have known she was in there. But again, I wasn't sure how long she was in there. My estimate was about three to four days since I last saw her, and not having bred calvus before and relying on online sources, I could expect the fry to become free swimming in about seven days, so I expected to see them in about another three to four days. But then I realised I would be in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on a cruise while that was all happening. I really struggled with my next move because I was reading about the male eating the fry the moment he saw them. I read that you should take the female out with the shell and place her in her own tank. All things I didn't want to happen or do. Last thing I wanted to do was stress them both out. The timing couldn't have been worse. I obviously really didn't want to lose the fry. So after some thought and discussion with my cousin and my uncle, who both also breed cichlids, I decided to just leave them be and hope for the best. I returned home after the cruise, which was only for eight days, and to my surprise, the female was still in the shell. I really was expecting to see the fry to be out by then, or at least visible in the shell, but nope. I thought maybe I got the days wrong when I last saw the female. Maybe they had spawned the day I finally found her in the shell. I just wasn't sure. But I was really glad I didn't move her out of the tank, stressing them both out and potentially breaking their bond. I would look down the length of the shell every day after work, each day expecting that today would be the day I would finally see the fry. But still, nope. <laughs> I was really surprised and beginning to get a little nervous about the situation, thinking maybe the male did eat the fry. Then about four days after I had returned, I finally, finally saw one baby swimming around in the shell. I was over the moon and with that, all my worries went away and I had finally confirmed they had successfully spawned. Over the next three days, I saw more and more fry at the one time swimming around in the shell with their mother moving back and forth within it. The male was extremely aggressive towards me during this time. Usually, if I get close to the tank, he just either stays where he is, swimming above his shell, or just hides in it. But this was different. Now he would stand his ground, flay his fins and gills out, and make himself appear as big as possible, and attempt to intimidate me by swimming up to me like you see here. He has only ever gotten like this on the two occasions they have spawned. After they spawn, he settles down again and becomes his relaxed, peaceful self. But when they spawn, he really does play his role in protecting his girl and his fry. I was really surprised to see this level of protection from the male. Reading online that the males eat the fry the moment they see them, I just really didn't expect much care from him. I was still unsure if he would eat them though, because the fry hadn't actually ventured out of the shell. 
Then I came home one day and noticed about 10 fry out of the shell. They were fully developed and luckily were all at the front of the tank, far away from the shell. I thought, okay, now is the time to get these guys out of here and that's what I did. I caught them all and put them in the tank above their parents. I was stoked and I was sure that there were more fry as the female was still in the shell. I heard that there could be up to 200 fry per spawn, but I had a feeling I wouldn't have that many considering the size of my female. The next day was the big day though, and thankfully it was a Saturday. Who knows if any fry would have been eaten if I went to work that day. But that morning I pulled out 60 plus more fry. I was over the moon. They had spawn, the male didn't eat the fry, and now I had over 70 calvers fry. Now again, you don't necessarily have to wait until this stage to pull the fry out. I've seen videos of people shaking the shell to extract the fry and the female, but I really don't like this practice as it stresses out the female and the fry. Some videos I've seen of people doing this really do shake the female up and could seriously injure or kill her. It's unnecessarily cruel. Taking the shell out with the female and the fry in it, placing them into a separate aquarium is a far better solution to avoid the male from eating the fry. About a day after pulling out all the fry, the female exited the shell and went back to her spot at the back of the tank. At this stage, the fry hugged the bottom of their aquarium, only appearing to hop up when food swept past them. I fed the fry baby brine shrimp, live microworms, pellets soaked in aquarium water for 10 minutes to soften them up, and the tiny pieces of mysa shrimp that come off the frozen cube just as it starts to defrost. I try to feed them three smaller feedings during the day when they're this size. However, that's not always possible with work and life sometimes get in the way, but do not let them go over 24 hours without a feed. They just don't have the fat reserves to last too long without food when they're this young. The other important thing, like with all fish, is to keep their diet varied to ensure they are getting a wide range of vitamins and minerals. Now my first batch of fry were going well for about a month, and then suddenly they started dropping like flies. I would come home to see one or two fry dead at the bottom of the tank. I could not work out what was causing it. It was so disheartening to see, and I was desperate to find an answer to help them. But this kept happening every day for almost two weeks before I realised what was causing it. Me opening the glass lid and it inadvertently clinking the glass was sending a shockwave through the water and basically stunning the fish. I realised it as I literally saw one spasm right before my eyes as I went to feed them one day. So I taped up the sides of the lid to prevent this from happening. But I wanted to come up with a better solution to feed them without having to open a lid at all. And strangely enough, the idea came at a time when I was visiting my father in hospital. Effectively, the solution was I would feed them via an IV line. I ran a small length of airline hose to their tank and basically injected food into it. This was time consuming to do, but it worked. The fish stopped dying after two or three days of feeding them this way. I also covered the front of their aquarium to further reduce any possibility of shocking them when I was standing in front of the tank. I kept doing this for about two months with no further losses and then removed the cover and fed them normally from the lid. It seemed that once they got to a certain size or age, that they are able to better tolerate disturbances. I don't know if all calvus are like this, but my second spawn went through a similar stage around a month in as well. I wanted to see if it was just an issue with the first batch of fry, or if it's just the stage that the fry go through. It didn't last as long this time though, as I just covered the front of the tank and did the same thing I did with the first batch of fry, and sure enough, it worked again. The fry from one batch will grow at different rates and it is recommended that you catch the slower growers out and put them in a separate tank, otherwise they will get eaten by the larger ones. So far, with my first batch, I've had to remove one fry out. It was so small that the second batch of fry were the same size as it, so I just transferred it in with the second batch of fry. With their second spawn, I was able to record down dates for each stage of the breeding process, just to see how long the entire process from spawning to catching the fry out took. So if you like, you can pause the video right here and read the details off on the screen. From the day the female entered the male shell to me seeing free swimming fry took just over three weeks, but the entire process from the female entering the shell to catching the fry out took almost a month. I believe that these guys are due to spawn again soon and I'm hopeful it will happen any day now. They have been a great pair for me and I've been extremely lucky with them. I think Alto Lamprologus calvus are a stunning fish and really can make a beautiful centerpiece of any Lake Tanganyikan community cichlid tank. I highly recommend them for someone who has had some experience in the hobby that is looking for something more of a challenge. As long as you are patient, not like me, and grow up a group of them together from a young age, you're pretty much assured to get at least a pair, and that is really rewarding. So yeah, that's my story about Alto Lamprologus calvus and how I bred them. Like many things though, please do your own research and see what works for you. 
So there you have it guys, my in-depth species profile on Alto Emperolobus caldus. I really hope you enjoyed that video and found it informative. If you did, please hit the like, comment and subscribe buttons. I really appreciate it. Now you might not be aware, but I already have a full playlist of all the in depth species profiles I've done in my fish room. You can watch our entire playlist right here, or why don't you consider watching my full fish room tour for 2020, and you can click on that playlist right here. Alright guys, I'm going to wrap this video up right now. Thanks heaps for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.